السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وجاءت سيارة سيارة فأرسلوا واردهم فأدلى دلوة قال يا بشرى هذا غلام وأسروه بضاعة والله عليم بما يعملون وشروه بثمن بخس دراهم معدودة وكانوا فيه من الزاهدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Once again everyone السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, Today my intention is to cover some lessons from ayahs number 19 and 20 of Surah Yusuf and this is the next major scene, the next major event. So we've left Canaan now, or we're on the outskirts of Canaan, way out there in, you know, in, in that ditch where Yusuf السلام, has been left. And a caravan is going to come and pick him up. Pick him up. And in Ayahs number 19 and 20, we're going to see the process by which he ended up in Egypt. Uh, before I go on, uh, those of you that are following this series regularly notice that for two days, uh, I took time off from this series to have a discussion about the biblical subtext and also the comparative analysis of these ayat with the Old Testament and the story of Joseph in Genesis. Um, and a lot of people, you know, I observe comments and what people are asking and some people say, what's the benefit of doing this? What's the point? We have the word of Allah, etc., etc. Those are all really good questions and it's, I'm glad that those kinds of comments surface because it gives me an opportunity to illustrate the thought process behind doing such an analysis. The first thing is that the, the, the people that came, according to some narrations, the people that came and asked the Prophet ﷺ about how did the Jews end up in Egypt, if you, if you are a messenger of God, then you, you know, then you will know how they ended up in Egypt. And part of that answer is actually this surah. He's revealing that answer to him to answer them also. Now the people who asked that question are the Israelites. They are the Jews of Medina. And by extension, you know, the Jewish people around the world. But by, in that immediate context, the Jews of Medina. And of course, this story has its main significance in Christian tradition also. The Qur'an is now going to take that opportunity to not only answer that question to prove he's a prophet of Allah who receives Arabic revelation, but he will also set the record straight about what happened. And when you say setting the record straight, you have to see where it deviated to begin with. Right, you have to understand, and they're, they're going to hear, those who are familiar with this story, when they heard the Qur'an's version, they saw some very, dis, very significant differences between what they knew all along, what was passed to them generation after generation after generation, and they believed they know the story of Yusuf, they know that story. But when Allah told the Prophet in the beginning, وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ When it comes to the story, one way of reading that opening ayah, is when it comes to this story, you were definitely from those who have no knowledge, who are, who are completely unaware, meaning unaware of this story. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ had no idea who Yusuf ﷺ is and what this story is. That, that I explained to you when we came to that ayah. But now we're also, by that comparison, we're also seeing that those who thought they knew the story, those who thought they knew what happened with his brothers, those who thought they knew what Yaqub ﷺ responded with, the response of the Qur'an is not even found in the Bible, what, what Yaqub ﷺ said, for example. And so many of the, the details are so incredibly divergent, they're so different, that it's basically like it had to be retold to, to, to set the record entirely straight. Now I want you to think of it not as a story, I want you to think of it as a criminal investigation. Okay, think of it as a kidnapping and a criminal investigation. And if there are investigators working hard to uncover what the truth is, and they've got one version where they've got like five, six, seven, ten details that are way off. And then you've got another version which has, you know, basically the right version. Basically now clarifying what really happened, right? Which is what the Qur'an is claiming. But in some cases, like on some points, there seem to be some similarity. Or you could take the, the account that has a lot of discrepancies, but 1%, 2%, 5%, 10% of it corresponds with the right account, right? What does that do? We shouldn't say, well, at least this much they got right. It's, it's not, that's not the purpose. Even then, because you know, when someone is wrong on five, six, seven, or ten fronts, in any investigation, they've lost credibility, you understand? They've lost credibility. So even the part that they got right, it's not this, what they're saying is not going to verify what the right version is. Instead, the right version will verify 
what they're saying. So the, we're not doing tafsir of the Qur'an through the Bible or understanding the Qur'an through the previous, what is left of the previous scripture. Rather, the Qur'an says, Muhaiminan alihi. The Qur'an is here to guard over the original teachings that were sent before. In the Qur'an, yaqussu ala bani, Isra, ala bani Israel. In the Qur'an, yaqussu ala bani Israel. Akthar alladhi hum fihi yaktalifun. This Qur'an narrates onto the Israelites most of what they have disagreements about. So, one of the reasons for studying that is, what are the disagreements? What are those disagreements that the Qur'an is saying it came to set straight for them even? For even them. And this is part of, you know, لِأَلَّا يَكُونَ لِلنَّاسِ حُجَّةٍ عَلَيْكُمْ حُجَّةٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْهُمْ So that there will be no case that they can make against you on judgment day also. That you hid this, or they, you know, because they said, we have our scripture, we don't need to follow yours. We, we already have something to believe in. Well, Allah says, no, come, come look at what I'm telling you. He's inviting them to the word of Allah, right? And so that's one clear benefit. The other really interesting benefit that's unearthed more recently, Western scholarship generally believed that the Qur'an came into context, because they don't believe it's from Allah, right? They just believe it's an Arab phenomenon that happened to become worldwide. Right, so they, they, when, when you study the religion of Islam in Western academia, you know, in Orientalist studies, obviously you cannot begin with the, even the possibility that this is revealed. They're looking at it as an emerging social phenomenon, an economic phenomenon, a political phenomenon, a cult that became worldwide. That's their definition, that's how they can see it. They cannot, the, any of the unseen cannot be part of it. So when, they, when, when they're explaining how he received this revelation, وسلم, they have to come with, Every explanation except Jibreel. <laughs> right, that's not possible. Everything else is possible. They'll, they'll claim him to be schizophrenic. They'll claim him to be plagiarizing from different sources and all of that. One of the things that this clarifies is he clearly didn't plagiarize from the Bible because this is like totally the opposite direction from the Bible. <laughs> the, the biblical account, Yaqub salam is upset with Yusuf for, for saying what he dreamt. The Qur'an is starting with Yaqub salam proud of Yusuf and validating him for sharing the dream. It's completely different. What do you mean he got it from the Bible? What do you mean he got it from the people of the world? It's a completely different account. The other interesting thing is, some Western ac academics believed, uh, and it was a long-held view, that the Qur'an is only addressing Jewish beliefs as they existed in the vicinity of Medina or the Arab lands. Jewish, Because you know, Jews and Christians have lots of denominations, right? Even today, they have lots of denominations. So the Qur'an was only addressing the views of the denominations that existed in that area. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, could not have known which, what, what's happening with Judaism in different parts of the world, or with the world of Christianity at large. Right? Because Christianity has been around now, you know, by the coming of the Prophet وسلم, it's been a few centuries. So, and Judaism is a few thousand years old, and it's world, they're diaspora, it's, they're worldwide, they're all over the place. And he doesn't have that global access to them. He doesn't know about their scholarship and their versions and their schools of thought and all of that stuff. So he could only have access to the Jewish and Christian scriptures that were in his close vicinity. And so the Qur'an is only addressing or answering their questions or what he came into contact with. Now with a careful study of the Qur'an with comparison to what is found in the Hebrew traditions, what we're discovering is the Qur'an is actually very, in, in a very precise way even taking sometimes verbiage, that because you know Hebrew and Arabic are sister languages, it's even taking verbiage that is found in Hebrew scriptures that, that was nowhere near to be found the Prophet in his lifetime, and the Qur'an is answering it. Which, which, is, which means he's not just, the Qur'an isn't just a da'wah, a, a call to the Jews and Christians of Arabia. It was actually speaking, the author of the Qur'an is the author of the original revelation of the Torah and the Injil. It's the same author. And sometimes he's using the same verbs for the same phenomenon. The, the, Cause sister verbs, Arabic has a verb and you know, uh, Hebrew has a verb. And the same verbs being used. Literally the same verbs being used. Like, you know, in, in the interview process, one thing that, um, you know, Saqib so brought up was the Hebrew rendition, which phonetically sounds, I won't even try to say the Hebrew cause he said that you will find it in the video in the second episode. But it's the closest verbs. And he said, he asked me, you know, I'm going to say the Hebrew, you guess the Arabic. That's what he told me. He said, I'm going to say the Hebrew, you guess the Arabic. And he said the Hebrew, and he's, the, the Hebrew was about the sons of Israel, meaning the sons of Yaqub being told, you're not going to spill blood. 
right? And when he said that part, I said, wait, that sounds like, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِثَاقَكُمْ لَا تَسْفِكُونَ دِمَاءَكُمْ You're not going to spill each other's blood. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, when He took a covenant from the sons of Israel that you will not spill each other's blood. Same verb. Same exact verb from the Hebrew text. And now it's being, and what does it occur? Not even in Surah Yusuf. It occurs in Surah Al-Baqarah. And in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says He took this covenant from the sons of Israel and the story is literally the original sons of Israel. Right? So the parallels sometimes are so powerful and remarkable that this itself is an important study for us to maybe even share and to, to appreciate what Allah has done in the final scripture, the final revelation, what He has done, and what was there before. And wallahi, every time we, we did this study, it even we discovered a little, then a little, then a little. It just Every time it just makes you go, Alhamdulillah for the Qur'an. <laughs> it just makes you just take a breath of, wow, this would have been so much more complicated if... Allah didn't reveal this to us. Like it just, وَيُتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكُمْ So He can perfect His favor on you. Allah has been favoring humanity with revelation all along. But the perfection of that favor is the coming of the Qur'an. You know? You know in English they say, by opposites things are known. Or they say, تُعْرَفُ الْأَشْيَاءُ بِأَفْدَادِهَا in Arabic. Things are known by their opposites. A similar expression, right? It's only when you see the contrast between what was before and what Allah revealed, do you appreciate what Allah revealed? One way you can appreciate it, you know? So that's, that's kind of a little bit about the, the, the backdrop. Now I want to move further with the story. We are now in this far off land. He's in this, you know, inside of this pit slash well that is unfinished. And Allah takes us immediately to that scene. So he already, the last scene we have in the Qur'an is Yaqub alayhi salam was telling, you know, Jacob was telling his sons that you've made something appear to be right for yourselves. I don't know what it is, but you've told yourselves somehow, sold it to yourselves as it's okay to do something heinous, something terrible. And the only thing, I, I can't get it out of you, so the only thing beautiful left for me now is patience. We talked about that before. And only Allah can help me against these creative lies that you keep giving me instead of giving me the truth. That's where we leave off. And now quickly there's a transition. Meanwhile, back at the well, right? That's what's happening now. What this in, in those of you that watch movies, astaghfirullah, know that there's cut scenes, right? So there's cameras here, all of a sudden fade somewhere else. You know, in the older movies, they used to actually have the narrators and meanwhile, back at the ranch, you know. <laughs> But what the Qur'an does, it takes you straight to a different place. The camera is now back at the, at the well, or in the vicinity of the well. And we're taken to, we're, we're, we're taken to a, a caravan. A caravan is a, you know, a, a travelers that are passing by. They've got their camels, horses, donkeys. They've got their stuff loaded. They've got their servants who, you know, they're the merchants who are the wealthy people themselves who are carrying all those goods. They're the ones that are going to make the business deals. But they've got a bunch of their servants and they've got their slaves, and you know, slave trade was part of, you know, part of the industry in the world back then. So they've got those, and they've got people that, are, that cook the food, etc., etc. So they've got this bunch of people that are just loaded, and they're, you know, this was old school logistics, right? Nowadays, Amazon, this was the old day Amazon, okay? <laughs> this is how Amazon deliveries used to happen, literally through an Amazon jungle. But anyway, so... So this is, they're traveling through, passing by, but in, you know, nowadays when you have a highway, you get like a rest stop 10 miles away or 5 miles away, you see signs for like there's going to be a hotel, gas station, or whatever, right? And so you get one of those signs, but they don't have that. This is, this is the old world. So Allah describes how things used to work in the old world. It's the same needs that people have when they travel. But the world is without this modern technology. It's without these highways. It's without, you know, the, the, the modernity of civilization. It's the old ancient world, right? So how did things work back then? You see, at sayyaratun, And a caravan came by. And a caravan moves slowly, right? So it's just kind of coming by. فَأَرْسَلُوا وَارِدَهُمْ So they sent their water fetcher. And the water fetcher can be a person. It can, the water fetcher, warid can also be a group. They're basically scouts. They see trees, they're like, if there are trees here, there must be water nearby, or greenery, there must be a river, lake, maybe there's a pond, go see, because they're running short on water. Because their animals are drinking, they're drinking, so every time they pass by somewhere where the terrain seems to be, maybe there's a little ravine, a canal, something, that maybe we can bathe in it, or we can get water, and feed our animals, etc., etc. So they send scouts out to look, and the, the scouts... From Warada, actually, it's, it occurs, interestingly enough, in the story of Musa alayhi salam, 
وَلَمَّا وَرَدَ مَاءَ مَدْيَنَا when he, when he fetched the waters of Madian And now here you've got, they're fetching the water Or the water fetchers are going out The same word is being used وَارِدْ and وَرَدَ So they, they go out there and they're looking for the water You can imagine maybe there's five of these, ten of these guys That are supposed to be scouts And they're looking and they're going in different directions And one of them notices a hole in the ground Right? فَأَرْسَلُوا وَارِدَهُمْ فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَاهُ So he lowered, slowly lowered his own bucket down. So he sees the hole. We know there's ghayabat al jub, which means the bottom of the well is so dark, it's black. So you can't really see the bottom of it, right? So he doesn't even know if there's going to be water at the bottom. And this well is so unfinished. You know, you imagine if, you, if I asked a kid to draw a well today, if they've ever seen one, they would imagine like maybe a you know, cylindrical, maybe some little brick wall structure. And there'll be some kind of a hanging arch on top. And there'd be a bucket that you lower down, right? So the well has its own bucket, right? The well comes with its own bucket. But you notice this well is so unfinished that he lowered, Allah says, فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَهُ He lowered his own bucket. So they actually came with their own bucket knowing that this area probably doesn't have anything finished. Also the idea that they sent water fetchers tells you that this is out in the wilderness. Because if this was civilization, you don't send people out looking for water, you just stop by at the gas station. You stop by at the restaurant, you know. You stop, you, and you, you know where the well is or whatever it is. Because there would be, you know, a village or something like that. So this is clearly out in, out in the middle of nowhere. He, puts his, he starts poking, putting his bucket down. Adla means to slowly put down. Dala, to pull up. To slowly pull up. And dalla is used in Surah Al-A'raf to describe how the devil slowly reeled Adam and Eve towards himself. And it's compared with the slow reeling of a bucket down a well. You know, or you know, sometimes they have these animal traps where they're trying to catch a rabbit but it runs too fast. So they'll tie a carrot or something like that to, the, the, you know, to a string and the animal comes to it and they pull it just a little and pull it just a little. They pull it just a, until it, the trap falls on top. Right, that's also dalla. But anyway, the idea, he's slowly dropping it down. So I don't want you to imagine that he took a bucket and chucked it down the well and it hit Yusuf Aisam on the head or something and he heard an ouch and he goes, what's going on? That's not what happened. He's lowering it down slowly until it's, it's gone so low that he can't even see it anymore because it's too pitch black, yes? Now, the Qur'an's language. Qala, he said, Ya Bushra, hadha ghulam. Now, I'll give you the old English translation that I totally disagree with. Maybe it used to work in like 1830, but it doesn't work now. Oh, glad tidings! This is a, gla- this is a lad. <laughs> so, the thing with that, or, or you know, let me give you contemporary translation. Whoa! Ya Bushra, wow! Oh my God! That's, that's Ya Bushra. And Hada Ghulam isn't, this is a boy. This is a boy. It means, it's a kid. Oh my God, it's a kid. Oh, and Ya Bushra is, there's wow that can be like, <gasps> but there's wow that could be like, you're happy about it. Bushra actually comes from good news, the Arabic word good news. Um, funny enough, we were discussing today, some of us Sirun had very creative interpretations of Bushra that have no basis, but it's still fun to read. <laughs> so some thought that there's like, because you know, there's a group of them, right? They're all looking for water. And one of them found a hole and he's like, I'm, I'm going to call the other guys when, if I find water. So as he finds this kid, I'll describe the scene about finding the kid. One of the other guys' name is Bushra. He goes, yo Bushra, it's a kid. That's actually one of the interpretations of it. That's not the interpretation. And then some said maybe Bushra is the name of a girl, like a woman. Because you know nowadays you have many people named Bushra, right? So no, and some, some I've, met, I've met some funny people. People say, what did you name your baby? We, Ustad Naman, we named our baby Bushra because it's in the Qur'an. I was like, like where? I know it's in the Qur'an, where? Oh, Ya Bushra hadha ghulam. Uh, ya Bushra is not a girl's name. It, you can use it for a girl's It means good news. But Bushra here just simply means, oh my God, this is great. This is awesome. And I'll explain why he thinks this is awesome. Why would you lower a bucket in a well, pull out a child without a shirt on, and then say, wow, this is awesome. This is a kid. This, this is great. Well, this would be an odd thing for you to not be happy about. But apparently he is happy about it. And that deserves attention. Why is, why is that happening? Now, this, before we get to that, it seems that when he's pulling the bucket back up, 
the image you might get in your head is he's pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling or he's just casually pulling it up and when it comes all the way up he's like, oh, there's a boy. Uh, no, because a bucket full of water and a child of a certain age, I think there's a little weight difference. Also, a bucket full of water won't wobble and move around, but it's an actual child. And the, even the act of the child climbing into the bucket or holding on, because the bucket's probably not big enough for the kid to fit in it, you know, for Yusuf Aisham to fit in it, so he's hanging on to it, or he's climbing on the rope or clinging on the rope. So there's some tug when you do that, right? So what's happening is he slowly lowered his bucket. Yusuf alayhi salam, obviously when he moved in, the rope is going to pull. And he's like, what's happening here? What the? And then he starts pulling his bucket back. And as he starts coming up into the light little by little, he goes, whoa, it's a kid. That's, that's the scene that's being described here. Not glad tidings. Here we have a lad. <laughs> you know? So he's, he's just shocked that it's a kid. And when he said, whoa, it's a kid, and he screamed it out, there are other guys that are looking for water in different places. What do they do? They converge towards this one guy. And now they're coming closer to him. So he pulls this boy out, Yusuf alayhi salam out, and says, Bushra hadha ghulam. Now ghulam in Arabic, by itself means boy. By itself. And similar to fata in Arabic, uh, means young man. And fatat in Arabic means young girl. But when you put an idafa on them, meaning if you put them in a, you know, in a possessive phrase, so for example, fatayatikum, fatayatikum, or fatahu, you know, if qala Musa li fatahu, right? When you put, when you, when you say his boy, or his young man, or his young woman, that actually was old language for his slave or his servant. Okay, so ghulam itself doesn't mean servant. But if you say his boy, or his ghulam, or this one's ghulam, or that one's ghulam, that actually was a phrase for, not my son, but rather my servant. Okay, so that's, that's old language. But they said, interestingly, they said the word ghulam, which doesn't mean slave, because there's no attribution of possession yet. It's a boy. It's this kid that they just found. Now, it's important to understand the, the, the scene that I've painted for you. Allah deemed it important enough to say that not that the caravan found him, that the caravan found him. He deemed it important to say that the ones who found him were the water fetchers. Right? So that detail is mentioned by Allah deliberately. Okay, so they, and they lowered their bucket. That's another detail that you're like, what's the significance of this detail? We didn't, he could have just skipped all of that and said, and a, and a caravan did find him. And we could have filled in the blanks with our imagination. They must have lowered the bucket, or they must have heard him cry, and they must have pulled him out, etc. Right? But Allah deemed it necessary for us to think about these pieces of information. Now, this is important because when they, when they fetched him, they are not the ones who own the caravan. The caravan is run by some millionaire. He's got his hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of goods that are being carried. He's paying the security guy, the cook, the cleaner, and the water fetchers. Right? He's paying all of those. They all work for the boss. So these guys are not the boss. They work for the boss. Which means they don't make a lot of money. They're poor. Yeah? And these poor men who are barely making anything, obviously you're not doing well for yourself if your career option is water fetcher for a caravan. Right? So you're, you don't, you're not living the life. And they know that boss makes a lot of money selling slaves. He makes quite a bit of money because I'm imagining the caravan probably also had slaves in it that are being taken for sale. And now they've got a boy and they know how much money is made from slaves. So they don't look at human beings as human beings, once they are turned into slavery, they look at them like sheep and goat and cows or whatever else. It's just a commodity to sell. And for these men, when they pulled up this child, now you understand why they're so happy all of a sudden. Oh my God! A oh boy! And the fact that he's not wearing a shirt makes him look more like a slave already. Right? Because if he's coming from, there's a family, or there's you know, dignified clothing and things like that, you might think that somebody cares for him. Or you can tell he's not a slave. But the way they left him, he, they left him in this destitute state, covered in mud. He's at the bottom of a well after all. So he already, he's got the slave look. So they say, wow, we can make some money now, finally. But, but boss better not find out. Because if boss finds out, what's boss going to do? 
add him to his stock, make a little bit of money for himself. So these few guys that are there that catch him, first of all, they think it's great news. You see, there's no other logic by which you can explain that them finding him is great news for them. Because those of you that have jobs and don't like your boss, when something's great news for your boss, that doesn't mean you're happy for it. <laughs> great news is when you get a bonus. Great news is when you get a free lunch. Great news is some, you know, you get extra time off. But when, if the boss makes more money and he's happy about it and you got nothing out of that, it doesn't do anything for you. You know? So they're happy because it seems, and this is one of the interpretations, there are several options that are offered. I'm offering you in my reading of this text. It's not the only way to explain this text. What I'm offering you to you is what I find the most compelling way of possibly looking at this text. There are details missing. So we do have to fill in the blanks and Mufassirun have tried to fill in the blanks when it comes to this ayah and, and, and what's really going on here. But I'm giving you one account which helps explain the rest of the text in a certain coherent way. Allahu A'lam, one day Allah Azza wa by His mercy enters us into Jannah and we can interview Yusuf alayhi salam and ask him for tafsir of Surah Yusuf ourselves. You know, and ask him about these ayat. What was going on here? What was going on here? What was going on here? But anyway, هذا غلام, this, it's, it's a kid. Wow, it's a kid. And they're happy about it. And we, how do we know we're hap- they're happy? Ya Bushra. Okay. Wa asarruhu bida'atan. And they, they kept him a secret. This is important now. They kept him a secret. If it is a large caravan, then the, car- the owner of the caravan doesn't have to keep on yet another commodity a secret. Or it could be that when they came back to the caravan, he said, don't, don't show them because the family might show up. We don't know where this kid is from. Maybe he just fell in there and their family will come looking for him, right? But there's another motivation too. For these men that work under the boss because they see an opportunity to make a quick buck, maybe. So they're like, uh, we got to find a way to hide this, stash this kid when we go back with water and not let him know that we're hiding him. So they, they, they hid him as a bid'a'atan, uh, actually means like a commodity. They, they hid him as something to sell. Some, a per, like a like a you know, retail item. They hid him away as something that they're going to make money off of. Now, bid'a comes from bid'a. And bid'a in Arabic means a, a cut off piece of flesh. Bid'a also means bid'a min al mal uh, is actually when you take a piece of your wealth for further investment. When you cut a piece of your money out and you put it away to make investment. So they took him and they hid him as if it's something to cut off from the rest of the caravan to use as an investment. Interesting use of the word because he's also been sliced away from his family, right? He's been cut off from his family. So, uh, so they say that, you know, the, the ayah says that they hid him away as an investment. Now at this point, he's a kid. And the Qur'an doesn't go any further in describing the, the, the steps that happened thereafter. Obviously, they found this kid if he tries to speak to them, Allah doesn't say he tried to tell them, look, I'm from here, please let me go. My, my family lives nearby, I, you know, they might be here. He's, even if he's saying these things, they don't want to hear it, do they? Because all they see is what? They just see money. So they might even hit him to shut him up. They might even gag his mouth. They might even tie him up and stick him at the bottom of a bag and throw other things on top. They could do what because it's, it's a thing to them. It's not a person to them. It's a thing. This is a thing of economic value. His life, his dignity, his needs, his emotions, his feelings, none of that matters. What matters is we can make a little bit of money. That's what matters. And I wondered as I was contemplating this ayah, because Allah will give us realities in this surah that are going to be realities until judgment day. It's not just a surah that happened a long time ago. These are realities until Judgment Day. What is the reality that Allah is teaching us in this surah? Human beings, are their value doesn't come from the, the social position that they're in. Here you have one of the most influential human beings that ever lived. He is the reason Egypt became a superpower. He's the reason. And he is found in a pile of mud in a ditch at the bottom of a well. You don't know the value, and this is from a worldly sense. In a dunya sense, in only a materialistic sense, he ended up changing the economic landscape of Egypt. When you look forward. 
But right now, he is just a kid without a shirt and a pile of mud and a hole in the ground in the middle of nowhere. Worthless. And to the people who picked him up, they see him as no different than a cow or a sheep or even a piece of meat that they can sell in the meat market. That's how they see him. That's all they see him as. Nothing, nothing more. The first thing the Qur'an is teaching us is that human beings, when, when greed becomes powerful, and when people live in certain kinds of economic situations where they see everybody's looking out for number one, the boss is looking out for himself, so we should look out for ourselves. When, a, when an economy or when a society becomes hyper-capitalized, when capitalism becomes in overdrive, then compassion and humanity starts disappearing. You would think normally a child in desperate need, any human being would see a child like that and would want to have compassion, find their parents. You know, that's normal human response. But when a society becomes desperate economically or greed becomes the religion, when greed becomes the religion, when the most important thing on the minds of people and the hearts of people is, where's the next dollar going to come from? then the compassion or the humanity side of human beings starts declining. And now let's compare that to our times. Is it possible that you can have, I don't know, pharmaceutical companies that are making billions upon billions of dollars that, can ha that have so much profit that if they gave their shareholders and their, their top executives more money they can ever consume, more mansions that they can ever live in, more cars that they can ever drive, and, and still have that left over, but drop the price of certain medications that certain starving countries need because they have a pandemic of some kind or a disease of some kind, and they can make that, that, those pills available for practically nothing, a cent a pill, because it costs them less than a cent to make it. But no, they'd rather sell that one cent pill in a package with $50. Right? and have an absorbent amount of profit share. Why? Because the people who can afford it, who have the sickness, are going to pay us top dollar for it. There's no reason we need to help the poor with this. And in their mind, look, this is what you're suggesting sounds very humanitarian, but it's capital suicide. It's, it's economic suicide. We can't do that to ourselves. In other words, the economy is more important than human life. Right? The economy is more important than human life. And... We're living in an interesting time where, I don't know if you can relate to this concept at all, that economic decisions are being made at the expense of human life, and we're not even batting an eye, right? But this, this concept that a human life can't be all that important, and then on top of that, you have something else. You have a class society. You're going to have a society that buys slaves, yes? That's what's going to happen later. We're not going to talk about that today. You're going to have a, which means they got money. They got money to buy slaves. And then you've got a society of people that are in absolutely desperate situation where even if they are not slaves, you can make their situation so bad they can become slaves. Like Yusuf Aysam is not a slave. He comes from a dignified family. But you can, you can find people that weren't meant to be that way and they're only going from the economic point of view further down. They're spiraling down. You've got this class society. And the people on top, have little to no empathy or feeling or mercy or care or concern for the people at the bottom. You know, we have this, you're, I mean, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but so you understand this picture, these people had no mercy for Yusuf a.s. And it doesn't seem like from here immediately he ended up in Egypt. These guys, they, they, they picked him up and they hit him like he's something to sell. And then Allah says, وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ And Allah, while Allah knew what they were up to. While Allah knew what they were actually doing. Meaning Allah knows the crime that you're committing. But Imam Razi added a really beautiful insight to this. He said, it's as if Allah is saying, and Allah knew that what they are doing is setting a chain of events in motion that, are going, that is going to fulfill the dream of Yusuf a.s. and they don't even know. They're committing a crime, but their crime is going towards a goodness that Allah has planned that is much bigger than even their crime. And he, Wallahu alimu bima ya'malun may even go back to his brothers. When they were putting him in the well, they were so jealous that Yusuf has more preference to our dad and he's this or that or the other. They set the actions, the, the, they, they created a set of circumstances that set in motion exactly the thing they're afraid of. 
And this is actually a parallel again, Suhaib pointed out today, with the story of Musa alayhi salam. I didn't see it before. They, Yusuf alayhi salam saw a dream, and soon after the dream, the, the, the evil doers set some events in motion that actually helped fulfill the dream. The Pharaoh saw a dream, wanted to kill babies, which set some events in motion that got the baby Musa to wa wash up to the shores of the palace and set events in motion that are going to bring about the nightmare that he saw. So, the, the, what they're doing, they think they're doing the opposite of you know, what they, you know, they're, they're doing what they intend. And Allah is doing the opposite with what He intends. So, wallahu alimun bima ya'malun. Now we come to another comment. وَشَرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ بَخْسٍ And they sold him for a price that was clearly unfair. Meaning, a, a short-changed price. Now this could mean many things. And, and let me finish the entire ayah and we'll comment on the whole ayah altogether. So they sold him for a measly price or they sold him for a basically unfair you know, robbery price, meaning they basically got rid of him for a price that's totally not worth who he is, which could be a comment on Yusuf is priceless. So no matter what you pay for him, it's priceless. And by the way, a narration of Ibn Abbas says it was 20 silver coins that were paid for him. And the, the Bible seems to also cor you know, correspond to that. There's 20 silver coins or something to that effect. That's the kind of money that a farmer would normally make in two to three years, which means eventually the price paid was actually pretty high. It was pretty high price paid for Yusuf alayhi salam. But Allah describes that as a pathetic price, meaning what he actually is and what you paid are two very, very different things. This is the Qur'an's way of telling us not just about Yusuf alayhi salam, but the value of human life. No matter what price you pay for human life, Human life is the highest economic value. There's no monetary value that can be put on it. It's beyond price. And whatever price you put on damage done to a human being, that's thaman baqs. It's an unfair price. That was not, that was not a fair price. Darahima ma'duda, a few dirhams, a few drachmas, meaning a few bucks. This is not, they, they sold him off for nothing. Now, there is the, the biblical version. I told you there are some points of conversion. The biblical version says that his brothers threw him in the well, then sat outside the well and had themselves a sandwich. And then like, what should we do? Should we kill him? Should we kill him? And he's still crying out for them. And they see a group of Midianites coming for trade. And they're like, we should pull him out and sell it to them. Sell him to him. That, so that's the Bible version. The Qur'an is clearly contradicting that version. How is the Qur'an contradicting that version? The Qur'an is contradicting that version because they drop him and they go that evening to their dad running. Yeah? And when they go to their dad running, then the sale is mentioned. So if we accept the biblical version and the Qur'an version, what would have to be the case is they went home to dad running to him, telling him we, you know, we were looking, we, we left him there, we were, went running and we got, we got sidetracked in our race and then a wolf came and ate him and all of that stuff. And then the next morning they're like, Dad, we're going to go out for a little bit, okay? Don't ask us where we're going. And they're coming back to get, grab him and sell him. It's implausible. The, so some say that this is about his brothers. Now, among our tradition, those who say that this, is, this ayah is about the, the, the brothers sold him are trying to make a correspondence between the Qur'an and the Bible. Like they're saying, oh, at least maybe there's one point of convergence. But the problem with that is if you look at the sequence here, they hid him as goods are the people who found him. And the people who found him, for what purpose were they happy? I already explained to you. What's the reason they're happy? So they could sell him. So the only logical thing now is who's going to sell him? Not the brothers. They're not, the brothers aren't interested in money. They're just interested in getting rid of him. Who's interested in money? These, the, the water fetchers. So they sold him for a measly price, meaning the next time they came to a slave market and the boss is busy making his wholesale deals, they go to the side, hey, I got this kid. You wanna... Before anybody finds out, before their boss even finds out. And if you're going to try to sell something at, a, at an unfair price, or you know, to, to get away quickly, then the guy will say, he's worth 100, but I'll give you 20. Okay, whatever, just give me 20. I'll take it, I'll take it. And split it among themselves. Darahima ma'duda. And Zahid, وَكَانُوا فِيهِ مِنَ الزَّاهِدِينَ Zuhud in Arabic means to not be interested in material things. To not be interested in the material uh, world. So a Zahid in the spiritual sense actually means someone who's not interested in the world. They're only remembering Allah and they're just, their only concerns are spiritual concerns. Interesting use of the word Zahid here. It's as if they sold him as if they weren't interested in making more money off of him. 
And it could be a play on words. They were, they were being real righteous when they sold him and gave him a good price. Like, I'm letting you have a really good deal here, but it's okay. And Allah is describing their self, you know, their, their, their uh, uh, fraudulent nature when they're making the sale. But it can also mean, the Zahideen can also mean they just wanted to make a quick dollar and they weren't interested in him or his well-being or what he's saying. His cries went unheard. His pleas for help went unheard. Now Yusuf used to be a boy, now he's been sold as a slave. But the slave, who, the owner who buys him, maybe he's also a, he's a wholesaler himself. He doesn't need slaves, he only buys them to what? Resell him. Yeah? So he's going to go find a new market and going to sell him for a little bit higher price. Then they're going to find him and they're going to sell him for a higher price. So he's going to get bounced off from slave trader to slave trader because they see him as a good deal. And especially if, he bought, if one bought him for a very low price, then he knows he can make a lot off of him. And the next one who buys and says, this is still a good price, I can make a lot off him. So what's happening is Yusuf's price is increasing. But I want you to, this is the economics of it, his price is increasing. And by the way, his price is going to increase to the point where he's going to end up in one of the elite markets, where the, the, the elite of Egypt... All the way to Egypt. Where we were in Canaan now, he's being sold, resold, resold, resold until he's where? In Egypt in some market. And in that market, the elite of Egypt, the governors, the ministers, whatever, they only buy the high brand, right? They have the special section for slaves that are like, you know, for them, the good looking ones or the, you know, the stronger ones or whatever, the more expensive. Oh, no, we've got a special section for you, sir. Come this way, you know, custom for you. And the, the, now that's the market that Yusuf is in. That's the economics of it. But let's rewind and let's look at the humanity of it. Here's a kid, here's a boy, a beautiful boy, who just moments before was in the loving arms of his father and then is being abused by his brother. Then he meets the scariest people that don't even look at him like a human being they look at him like a thing and gag him and slap him around and throw him in a bag and hide him. Then he gets grabbed and just sold. And he, then from there, he's being, you know, whatever. If they're beating him, they're taking his clothes from him, they're rope, putting rope on his neck, they're yanking at him like they do with animals. And he's going from one, and slave owners, you don't imagine that these slave traders are humanitarians where they say, come sit over here. Maybe you want me to get you something? You know? That's not how they're going to treat their slaves. They're going to put them in line, right? And he's not just around the slave owner. There are other slaves there. And the other slaves are hardened and seasoned because they've been doing that labor for a long time. So they see the new kid and they're bullying him and they're beating him up. And they're kicking him around. He's going through this horrible experience one to the other, to the other, to the other. And no one's looking out for him. No one's concern for his well-being and he is going to now in this way end up all the way in the market of Egypt and by the way he by the time he ends up there you have to try and imagine the kind of trauma he's been through the kind of mental breakdown that is being done to a kid who's being put through this right you know kids can get brainwashed right you have in the world today you have uh, child armies kids that are stripped from their families and forced into militias 10-year-olds holding machine guns. That's, that's done. And they make them kill someone. They make them do it. And they do it so they can mess with their heads and remove humanity from them, turn them into cattle. So they can be used as the front line of fodder. So the first people to die are these kids. Because they're worthless. We can just get, grab more from the next village. We could just do that. And he, when you're treated that way, you start seeing yourself that way. And that's an important thing. When... You are, if someone's being told all the time, you're worthless, you're worthless, you're worthless, you're worthless, you're worthless. You know what? Eventually the person starts looking in the mirror and what do they start saying to themselves? You're worthless. Their, their self-image changes because of the effect of the environment. But there's something special about Yusuf a.s. He's being dragged around, the, the, no, no clothes, no shirt, and probably even worse, and then, you know, being tied up and sold and bullied and pushed around, but he's not losing who he is. He's, there's still something in him. And they see him enough, they, even the slave traders see enough that say, oh, this kid, maybe we should put him aside, because I think some of the wealthier clientele might be interested in a servant like this one. He looks more refined. 
he looks more educated. He looks classy. Some of the classy clients, they might want a servant like, it's a good look for when they serve tea. It's a good look for them, right? So they want, because uh, back in the day, nowadays when you go to somebody's house, you look at their nice furniture or you look at the car or whatever. Back then, wow, nice slave. Wow, where'd you get that? This, is, this was the mentality. And again, this was back then the mentality where human beings were looked at as a commodity but I'm telling you that the modern world has its own way of doing this. It may not be children being sold into slavery literally, and that still may be happening in some places. But even in the so-called modernized, civilized, you know, refined, new world, human beings are looked at as commodities. They're looked at as nothing more. I remember reading one of the, one of the most disturbing um, you know, uh, research papers that I ever read when I was in college. Uh, and I was in college, and my, my first business, international business class, we, we read a research paper on uh, low-income workers in the United States, like minimum wage workers, so people that work in like a restaurant, like a, chain, like a McDonald's or a Taco Bell or something like that, or people that are working at the backs of warehouses, stocking and unstocking, loading and unloading in grocery stores, things like that, right? The laborers, or you know, the, the, the cleaners in the kitchens, and, you know, and, and, and places like that. Those people, they were talking about how those people have high rates of depression and anxiety and they have, you know, they have very difficult lives and they have difficult situations. So a lot of them have, and they might even resort towards crime or try to steal from the restaurant and things like that. And you know, the, the larger businesses, these franchise companies, they keep track of that stuff. But they don't keep track of that stuff because they're concerned about this one person who's going through a hard time and then they stole $5 from you know, the cash register. They're concerned that if they do steal $5 and we have to fire them, then we have to hire a new person. And in the middle of that hiring process, we have to have pay HR money to hire the new person. So it's a higher cost. So that person becoming so desperate that they steal is a higher economic cost for the business. So what we need to do now is we need to institute services for these employees. So they put in services, they call them chaplaincy services. So any, they would give these brochures to these employees that are working, you know, and have the tendency to kind of falter or fall apart or quit or whatever. They say, hey, um, are you feeling down? There's free pastoral services. There's uh, 30 minutes every week where we get, uh, you know, uh, somebody to come in and talk about God and how life is good and like they, they bring in someone to mellow these people out so they get the fear of God so they won't steal that $5. But that's not because they're interested in God or morality. That's because to them, these people are basically on the thin, the thin ice before they become a, a, a liability to us. And to keep them above that, we're going to do whatever we can to just keep them at the level where we need to take full advantage of them. It's like they're treating human beings like you would t treat a recycling facility like garbage. That, that's, that's what this is. That's what we've done with, in modern economics. And so, you know, when, when we read this story about they sold him for a small price and they were so quick to just sell him off and they didn't value him, think about all the, all the you know, businesses in which employees are not given basic rights. Businesses in which, you know, and, and, and governments and countries in which, you know, there are children working in factories. Or there are people working 40, 50 hour weeks, 70 hour weeks without a break. I won't even name the country because I don't care to name countries. I went to a place where, the, you know, the guy was, happened to be from Pakistan. The, the, my taxi driver happened to be from Pakistan. And I just started talking to him in Urdu, just sharing stories or whatever. And literally two minutes into the conversation, the guy was in tears. I was like, why are you... What happened? He goes, nobody says salam alaikum to me. I've been driving a taxi for like three years. Nobody says salam alaikum. It's a Muslim country. Nobody says salam alaikum to me. They treat us like garbage. You're the first time somebody says salam alaikum to me. And I start talking to him. He tells me three years he hasn't had a day off. And if he's sick, he has to pay for it. And if some drunk gets into his cab and throws up all over, he has to pay for it. It comes out of his paycheck. And he hasn't seen his family. And he hasn't, and he hasn't, and, but I was like, why don't you just go back? He goes, what do you want me to starve? This is the only option I have. That's not modern economic slavery. That, that's not slavery. And then those same places have the fanciest malls and on the outside, well, I want to come here. All the restaurants are halal. Yeah, but those people aren't, those, what you're doing to those people is haram. 
That's, that's evil because you're treating people like a commodity. You don't care if they get, in, get injured during a you know, construction accident. You don't care. You don't care if they get sick on the job. You don't care if their families are devastated because of the way you're treating them. You don't care that you're paying them not even a fraction of what you would consider humane. But you don't, because you can get away with it, so you don't care. It just doesn't matter to you, you know. You don't care. That, and there, there are some cases, oh, my employer got angry with me, so he stopped paying me. So I'm hoping he pays me. Oh, and he has my passport too. So if I make noise about it, he'll just burn my passport. He'll send me back. Or he has connections with the government. I, they, I, they'll never see me again. Don't tell anybody I said anything. Don't tell anyone I said anything. Wow. That's, that's the reality a lot of people live in. وَشَرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ بَخْسٍ دَرَاهِمَ مَعْدُودًا وَكَانُوا فِيهِ مِنَ الزَّاهِدِينَ Allah put a prophet of his, Yusuf, a prophet of his, through this, so that we would pay attention to when someone goes through this. Like it brought, Allah brought attention to human beings being treated like a commodity. And if we become supportive of economic structures, businesses, that have these unethical practices, and we do nothing about it, then we are no better than the minister who bought him. And we have a good, I don't have a good opinion of the minister, by the way. Then tafsir, we have a better opinion. I don't, personally don't have a good opinion of him. Why? Because when he bought him and he said honor his housing and all of that, he's still keeping a slave, isn't he? If he really liked this kid so much, he could have, where'd you come from? Where do you live? What's your father's name? Let me just get you back. Was that possible for a minister in Egypt to do? Yeah. So yeah, he's not beating him up like the slave traders are, but he's oppressive with a smile on his face. You see, there's, there's blue-collar oppression, and there's white-collar oppression. You know, there's the streets oppression, and there's the corporate headquarters oppression. There's still oppression. It just doesn't look as bad on the outside. You know, it's done with a smile, but it's still oppression. It's still slavery. It's still wrongdoing. It's still robbery. So Allah is actually showing us in His Qur'an the, re the ugly reality of the outside world. The ugly reality of how, what, what un unfettered, unchained greed can do to a world. And how even those who naturally we would have mercy for, children, will be nothing before the agenda of greed. They'll be, we will run over even children to fulfill greed, the needs of greed. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us from becoming parts of such a machinery. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us aware of the evils that are happening in society around us and at least not be a part of such evils. And at least have the courage to speak out about such evils when they do take place. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us and our children and may Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who by their, by their earnings and by their spendings make the world a more ethical place, a place closer to what Allah Azza wa Jal wants for us in light of His book. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Oh, you still there?